Well, hello, everybody, and I'm thankful to be able to speak uh, once again on this Wednesday night uh, to the wonderful people there at the Franklin Church of Christ. And it's been, uh, it's really been special for me uh, these four weeks in a row. I appreciate so much the invitation, and uh, I'm thankful for Stephen Kirby working so hard to make it work, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. I, we, we really prefer coming in person because we love the drive to Franklin, love to see you all face-to-face. There's so many people there that we know and love on a personal level, and uh, always encouraged when we come there, but I'm thankful that we've had this opportunity to share these Wednesdays, but they've been unusual. Last week, I shared with you uh, that uh, we were taping it, I think, on Monday because my wife, Carol, who would be with me if she possibly could be, uh, she was getting ready to have surgery. We taped it on Monday. Her surgery was on Tuesday at Vanderbilt Hospital. They replaced her aortic valve, and it was very successful. She went home Wednesday. She's home recuperating, and I'm thankful for that. And so then we had one more week and uh, we were actually scheduled, we're taping this right now, it's about 12.30 uh, in the afternoon, early afternoon on Wednesday. So what you're watching is very, very fresh. Uh, but we were scheduled to tape it at noon on Monday. But Monday morning, I was in my office on the campus at Lipscomb, and uh, it doesn't really matter what I was doing, but I did something I wasn't supposed to do. And my right hip, which is an artificial hip, which was replaced back in 2012, it dislocated. Now, that's all, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. It's just something that requires an ambulance. It's, it also requires being put to sleep. It also requires uh, kind of spending about seven hours in the emergency room at Vanderbilt Hospital. That's the reason that uh, and I don't, uh, Andrew is behind the camera, and he's going to make it possible for you to see that I'm wearing a, a very unattractive leg brace on uh, this right leg to keep this hip from from falling out of place again. It's not going to do it. I guarantee it's not going to do it while we're on this camera, and it won't do it while I have this brace on. But uh, but I've also asked him to try to keep the camera up above the waist level so that uh, you won't have to look at that ugly brace uh, throughout the time. However, uh, I'm so thankful for Andrew. Andrew is working the camera today, and uh, that's not what he does on a regular basis around here, although he's very capable at that and so many other things. He's our worship leader, our full-time worship leader, and, and, and he may be... And he certainly is one of the very best worship leaders on the planet. And he's doing a great job here. But when I had this accident on Monday, quickly I got word that Andrew would be glad uh, to prepare a message and send to the folks at Franklin, Kentucky. And because he is a great speaker as well as a great worship leader. But I thought to myself, I said, I love for those people in Franklin to invite me back. And if they hear Andrew, they'll forget about me. And I will never hear from them again because you'll want Andrew to come. And, and Andrew will do a fabulous job. And he'd be delighted to come or delighted to send you something on tape. But I'm thankful that he's here helping us out, working the camera. And, uh, and I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to, to spend a few minutes with you. Let me share with you one quick story. I may have already shared this story because I need to tell you, this isn't the first time. It's not even the second time. It's the third time my hip has come out of joint since it was replaced eight years ago. And uh, after the first time, and this will, I'm just demonstrating the sermon illustration God gave me, but I'm also telling you what a slow learner I am. Because when it first came out, and it first came, it, it was replaced in 2012, it first came out in 2016. And after it came out, I called the nurse up at the doctor's office and I said, I want to be sure that this never happens again. Yeah, right. I want to be sure this never happens again. Where can I look on the internet to find instructions on being sure this doesn't happen again? She said, all you need to do is read the book we gave you before you had the surgery to replace your hip. And and so I asked my wife, I said, where's that book? She said, well, we keep it in the filing cabinet downstairs. Well, that's down in the basement. In fact, we went down to the She went down to the filing cabinet, found the book, came up, and there was a diagram. Exactly what I was doing, which was touching my toes, drying my feet after getting out of the shower. And there's a guy there drying his feet in a a kind of a diagram, and it had a big X across. Do not do that. That was in a book that was in my house two floors from where I fell after dislocating my hip. And 
I thought, man, there's got to be a sermon in this somewhere, and there is. What does the Bible say? Be doers of the word, not hearers only. I had heard the instruction, but I wasn't following the instruction. Too many times we have our Bibles tucked away, not in a filing cabinet maybe, but maybe on a bookshelf or maybe just on the bedside table, and we, we, we may even read it. But you know, the, the Sermon on the Mount closes with that wise man, foolish man story, and both the wise and the foolish man heard the Word of God, but one obeyed, one disobeyed. The one that obeyed survived the storm. The one that disobeyed was destroyed by the storm. And so my, you know, all of a sudden... What I did Monday morning was something that I had already been instructed. That's not the way you're supposed to do things. But you get in a hurry, you forget, you take things for granted. And our lives don't need to be like that. We need to read the Word of God every single day. We need to pay attention every single day to what God tells us. We need to meditate on His Word day and night. What does it say in Psalm 1? Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. Whatever he does will prosper. His leaves will, his leaves will not wither. And we need to pay attention to what God tells us to do. So with that in mind, uh, you just need to just help. Just pray that I will learn my lesson and pay attention to the rules and won't have to put up with with this kind of a situation again. But we've got something that's even more important to talk about because to, today, tonight, whenever you're watching this, uh, we're going to talk about three keys to victory. And, uh, you know, that's kind of like something you might hear people talk about before they're getting ready to watch a football game on TV. And I'm hoping we're going to get to see some football games soon here on TV. And sometimes they'll ask, you know, well, you know, give us what, what are the three keys to victory for this team or that team? And then somebody will give their expert analysis and, and you'll agree or you'll disagree. Well, we're talking about this as far as our own individual lives are concerned. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a passage out of Revelation that I think gives us three very simple keys to victory. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, but let me tell you why it's so important. This passage in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says, Be alert and of sober mind, because your enemy... And I might ask you, do you have any enemies? And a lot of you, I'm sure, could say, I don't have any enemies. Well, you do. It may not be a human being, but your enemy, and then he identifies who it is, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone, and you could be that someone, looking for someone not to just injure, but devour, to destroy, to absolutely wipe out. Now, that's a scary verse, but, but, but it's, not, it's not a verse that doesn't have a Word of, word of advice and a word of uh, good godly counsel. He says, the next verse, resist him. Don't give in to him. Don't just say, oh, I'm going to throw up my hands. There's no way I can survive. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. I mean, we live in a world right now where people all over the world are going through horrible sufferings. I mean, you think about what's happening in some of the cities, what's happening in Portland, Oregon right now, and what's happening in, in other places. You just name the place. And, but, but then you go to other parts of the world, and, and sometimes it's even worse. People are going through all kinds of sufferings because the devil is at work. Satan is at work. And what we're going to talk about today has to do with how we can win the victory against Satan. Now, I realize, and I'm excited about this for you, I realize that Joe Beam is going to do the next four Wednesday nights. And let me tell you, Joe Beam, as I think I mentioned the first week, Joe Beam is one of my favorite speakers, and he is a great teacher. And some of you I know already are aware of that. Maybe all of you are already aware of that. And he's going to be talking in a whole lot more detail 
about the seen and the unseen and the things that, the, that Satan can do and the reality of this and how we need to depend on Jesus Christ. And so what we're talking about tonight is just kind of a skimming the surface, just, just the touching the hem of the garment, just, just a quick little introduction that hopefully will whet your appetite to go into a lot more detail when Joe is here the next four weeks to talk about Satan and how we can win the victory in Jesus Christ because everybody is going through those sufferings. But then Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, he tells the Corinthians, we live in the world, but even though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, the weapons we fight with have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now, we're going to talk about three keys to victory, and the three things we mention would fall into this category. They have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now, you may want to open up your Bible to Revelation 12. We're going to read here the 10th and the 11th verses. Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. And verse 10 is simply, I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. But then you go on to the, 10th, the 11th verse, rather. I'm, the, the accuser of our brothers and sisters, and this has 10, I think it's actually verse 11, that's my fault because I prepared the PowerPoint, the accuser of our brothers and sisters. Now, who is that? That's Satan. The accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Now, now Satan, one of his tactics is to accuse God's people. And probably some of you have actually been involved in, in how Satan can kind of take the, take the wind out of your sails. Satan can take the, the heart out of your life. He can make you think you're not worthy, you're not good enough, you're a sinner. And, and there's a story in Zechariah chapter 3. We don't have time to turn to it and read it, but Zechariah chapter 3, the first five verses, tells a story about a man named Joshua, not the Joshua that led the Israelites across the Jordan River, but another Joshua who was a high priest who was standing before God, and it says Satan was right there beside, his, beside Joshua accusing him before God, saying he's not worthy. You, you don't need him. He, his, and, and guess what? God silenced him. Read that story because that's the way Satan works. That's the way Satan has worked with some of us. That's the way Satan will really make us just want to throw in the towel and say it's, it's not worth it. But, but the accuser has been hurled down. He has been defeated. And, but how was he defeated? They triumphed over him. And here is the 11th verse. Maybe I'll get it straight here in a minute. And I'm sorry if I'm a little confused. But they triumphed over him. How? How did the people win the victory over Satan. He mentions three things. First of all, by the blood of the Lamb. Secondly, by the word of their testimony. And third, because they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. They weren't afraid to die. They weren't afraid to give their lives because they knew they had so much more to live for than this world could ever offer. But let's go back. First of all, they trumped, they won the victory, the first key, by the blood of the Lamb. Now, the Lamb is Jesus. And it's the blood of Jesus that makes it possible for us to win the victory over Satan. You and I can't win the victory by ourselves. We can't even begin. We'll be devoured. Without the blood of the Lamb, we stand no chance whatsoever. But it's the blood of it's the it's what Jesus Christ has done for us, paying the penalty for our sins, winning for us the victory over the grave, that you and I can be confident that Satan will not destroy us. Now, 1 Peter 1, you know, you know it was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, which are perishable. They're not going to last forever. But it was not with perishable things like silver and gold that you were redeemed 
You were purchased. You were paid for from the empty way of life, rescued from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors. It wasn't with, with, you didn't buy it with silver and gold. You weren't redeemed by silver and gold, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without blemish or defect. Now, how do we belong to Jesus? How do we belong to God? How can we pray our Father? How can we thank Him for the fact that we are His children? It's because we were purchased by the blood of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. Every Sunday when we take that unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, we're remembered of His body and His blood. And we take it sometimes for granted. And we we lose sight of just what a priceless, priceless gift that is. But the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, is what God used to pay the redemption price for you and for me and for everyone you ever meet. Now, we've got to put our faith in him. But it begins with him, even when we were sinners, he died for us. He died for us because that's the only hope we have. Then, Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, there's this interesting phrase in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, Christ, and he describes him as our Passover lamb. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Now, you notice I have Exodus 12 there, and you probably don't even need to turn there to be reminded of that story. That's the story of when the Israelites were delivered from Egyptian bondage, and they went through the ten plagues. You remember the ten plagues. And what you may also remember, that the last plague was when the Lord was going to pass through the Egyptian land. And he was going to take the life of every firstborn. Everyone. But God, through Moses, told the Israelites, he said, here's how you can be spared. You take a lamb, a male lamb, a year old without blemish, and you kill that lamb, and you take the blood of that lamb, and you spread it on the doorpost. And when God comes to Egypt on that night, to take the life of all the firstborn, he will see that blood on your doorpost and he will pass over that house. And he says from here on, you will celebrate the Passover just like we take the fruit of the vine and the the unleavened bread every Sunday. From, From now on, every year, the Jewish people, even to this day, they have the Passover feast and what they're doing, it goes all the way back. But Think about this. Do you remember when Jesus was about to be arrested? And there is a time when the crowds were so gathered around Jesus and the Jewish officials, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to get him out of their hair. They wanted to get rid of him. But they said, we can't do it during the Passover. Why? There are going to be too many people here and too many people like him, and it could be chaotic. We can't do it during the Passover. Guess what? They weren't calling the shots. They weren't making the decision. Because long, you know, many, 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 many years before then, when the Passover lamb was killed in Egypt, that was a sign, that was a a foretaste, that was a prophecy of what was going to happen in Jerusalem when Jesus' blood was shed for us. The blood of that lamb spared the lives of the firstborn and the Israelite families. The blood of Jesus spares the life of all of us. They were delivered from slavery. We're delivered from sin. And Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb, and he has been sacrificed for us. One more passage, and you know this passage, 1 John 1. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us 
from all sin. Because guess what? The blood of Jesus is important when we're initially saved, but it's also important to keep us clean all the way until we meet Jesus face to face. And as long as we keep walking in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with our brothers and sisters, which I miss getting to enjoy with you on these Wednesday nights in August, but, but that day will come again. But we have not only that wonderful fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, but the blood of Jesus that was sacrificed for us on the cross of Calvary, it purifies, it's kind of like the windshield wipers that keep that, that sin washed away as long as we're walking in the light. doesn't mean we're perfect because we're not perfect, but we're doing our best to do what God has called us to do. So they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb, and then the second thing, by the word of their testimony. And we'll go through this a little bit quicker. That word testimony is a word that, you know, we, we've certainly heard it. I don't know how familiar you are with it. I was, I've been pretty familiar with it most of my life because my dad, I grew up in the house with a father who was a courtroom attorney. And, uh, and so I, I knew about cross-examinations. They would happen a lot of times around the dinner table, and it wasn't always comfortable. And, and there are different experiences like that. But testimony, if, you, if I ask you what does the word testimony mean, one of the best definitions it's first hand authentication of a fact. It's, it's authenticating a fact with first hand experience. Now, the, the opposite of that is hearsay. Hearsay is when, well, that's what they told me. Did you see it? No. Did, do you, do you, do you have a, were you a personal eyewitness? No. But, but that's what they told me. That's hearsay. First hand is when I saw it. I experienced it. You know, there's a story in John chapter 4 that uh, if we had time to study this, this is when Jesus goes to the well. There's this woman from Samaria. He's in the Samaritan land. And, and the, the apostles had gone off to get something for lunch. And this woman comes up and he starts a conversation with her. And in that conversation, they, have, they discuss a number of different things. And then finally, he says, why don't you go call your husband? He says, I don't have a husband. He said, you're exactly right. Because the man you're living with is not your husband. You've already had five husbands. And she says, she's just kind of blown away. He didn't do it in, in a cruel way because she didn't just run away. She didn't have to continue the conversation. But, but, but she, when the apostles arrived, she had gone back to her home. And she's telling her friends, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. She's giving a first-person account. I've got, I've got somebody you've got to meet. This guy, I mean, he knew me inside and out. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. So she went and started telling people about what she had experienced with Jesus. And then in the 39th verse of the fourth chapter, it says many of the Samaritans from that town, after being around Jesus, they believed in him because of the woman's testimony. But then they said, after being around Jesus, they said to the woman, we no longer believe you just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves. We know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Now, their, her testimony, which was her firsthand account, that's what created an interest. But, you know, that wasn't enough. They wanted to go see for themselves. And when they saw for themselves, said, we no longer believe just because we heard what you said. We have experienced it ourselves. Now, let's go back. And uh, here we look at this passage. They trumped by the blood of the Lamb. We've talked about that by the word of their testimony. Now, let me, let me say what we're talking about there. In order to win the victory over Satan, we don't need a hearsay faith. We need a first-hand faith. I heard somebody say one time, God has lots of children, but God doesn't have any grandchildren. Now, what that means is my, I'm connected to my children directly, same generation, I mean, just, you know, just immediate. They're my children. My grandchildren, it's through my children. We don't come to Christ through any other human being. We don't come to Christ through our spouse. We don't come to Christ through our parents. We don't come to Christ through... We're taught about Christ by some of those people. We're influenced about Christ through some of those people. But we must come to Christ personally. 
We must have a first-hand experience. And if we want to win the battle against Satan, we've got to have a testimony. We've got to have first-hand experience. I know. It's kind of like the, the guy who was healed of his blindness. He said, you know, whether he's good or bad, I don't know, talking about Jesus. All I know is I was blind and now I see. And, and, and here they were able to give their own testimony. But real quickly, look at this verse again. One more thing. First key, the blood of Jesus. Second key, the firsthand personal faith when you really give your life to Jesus with no middleman. I mean, the middleman might help you get there, but then all of a sudden you become the one who really know. I want to know Christ, Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 3. I want to know Christ. I don't want to just know about him. I want to know him. But then the third thing, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Now, I'll close with this, but you know, if I mention 9-11, we probably all think of the same thing. You probably can remember where you were on that Tuesday morning, 9-11-2001, September 11, 2001, when you first heard, as I first heard, a private plane had crashed into the World Trade Center. That's the first thing that was told me, and, but, uh, but obviously it was a whole lot more than that, and it changed the world. It changed the world. When this pandemic started, I remember being in a conversation way back in the month of March and said, you know, 9-11 changed the world in a lot of ways. It changed the ways you fly on an airplane. It changes a number of different things. But I said, you know, do you think anything will ever change? Well, a lot more. It seems like a lot has changed in the world today. A whole lot has changed. That's the reason that we're doing this video, because the world has changed. It's the reason schools are having a challenge, because the world has changed. But the reason 9-11 made such an impact on the world is why? Because a couple of handfuls of men, men who were wrong, men who were misguided, men who made horrible mistakes, men who became murderers, but you know what? They knew. They knew they were going to have to give up their lives in order to accomplish their mission. Unfortunately, tragically, their mission was absolutely wrong. Their mission was horrible, but they were so convinced that it was right that they were willing to give up their lives. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus has called us to a mission that is not wrong, that is not horrible, that is not short-sighted. He's called us to be his disciples and to make disciples of everybody we come in contact with whenever possible. He's called us to take our eyes off of ourselves and off of this world. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But he says, you've got to realize it's, it's so important. If necessary, it becomes, it becomes the absolute priority of your life. And, and, and for example, he says, whoever wants to be my disciple, if you really want to be my disciple, you must. He doesn't say you should or you could. He says you must deny yourself. Stop doing things. Oh, I love doing that. Well, Maybe sometimes we need to learn to deny ourselves, but here's the, here's the real key. And take up your cross. Now, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, that's my cross to bear. Well, a cross is voluntary. Well, it's, it's voluntary, but sometimes when they took up their cross, it wasn't any voluntary. They were forced to do it, but they had to pick it up because they carried their cross where they were going to be crucified. But when they carried their cross, they had already been condemned, they had already been convicted, they had already been sentenced, and they're about to die. Their life is over. Their human rights are no longer valid. When they took up their cross, they were headed to their death. They no longer were looking out for themselves. They were just being obedient to what they were being told. And Jesus says, you need to live, to live your life in such a way that you're not going to shrink back from death. You're not going to take the easy way out. You're going to say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Because he says, whoever wants to save their life, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And so these three keys, the blood of Jesus, the personal faith in Christ, the first-hand experience, the testimony, and a person who's willing to take up their cross 
and say, there's nothing I live for that's nearly as important as living for Jesus. Now let me close with three questions and we're done. First, personally, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? You remember that song we sing, Have you been to Jesus? Don't, don't sing it with me right now. But have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you have the blood of the Lamb as the source of your life? If not, why not? Secondly, is your testimony, your experience with Christ, is it firsthand or is it hearsay? And if it's not firsthand, then why not? Or what do you need to do? And then third thing, what are some ways that we can lose our lives for Jesus. Mike, I, I know this to be a fact. There are people in the congregation there at Franklin, this is already the way you live your lives. You have that first-person relationship. You know Jesus. You pray to him. He's your, he's your best friend. He's your savior. He's your Lord. He's your confidant. You already have that testimony. You know that the blood of Jesus washed away your sins when you became a Christian, and you know it washes away your sins every single day. And you also know that doing what you want to do just pales into comparison with what Jesus has called you to do. And you live your life like that. You pour out your lives into others. But what about the rest of us? Are you depending on the blood? Do you have that personal relationship? And are you willing to give your life for the one who gave his life for you. Thanks again. God bless you, and I hope to see you again really soon.